The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Hey, Kara Ustraus here with realagriculture.com. I am here today with another Wheat School episode. We are here at Wheatstock in St. Albert, Alberta, and I have here with me Sherry Stridehorse, who is with Alberta Wheat and Barley Commissions. How's it going today? Good, Kara. We've been a little wet today, but you know, now we're, um, now things have dried up a little bit and it's a great time to have some conversations about nitrogen. Absolutely. Okay, so nitrogen, you have this whole cycle behind you. Do you want to tell me a bit about what we're looking at here? Absolutely. So what we're trying to do um, this summer and a lot of our extension activities is talk about the science behind nitrogen transformations and how nitrogen changes in the system, in the soil, where points of loss are. And the reason for this um, theme to our summer um, extension activities is really wanting to kind of educate producers so that they are aware of when these federal government mandates are coming down about proposed reductions in greenhouse gas emissions uh, due to fertilizer what is the science behind it how is the nitrogen changing in the system and therefore um, where are the points where they can mitigate that loss so I, I have this nice diagram here that want to just kind of try and work on that science piece um, because um, maybe just to, to lay it out there and um, acknowledge that producers are absolutely frustrated with this. I know you've covered it many times, Kara, but you know, the profitability implications of this, um, the challenge of trying to feed a hungry world on reduced fertilizer, and then the supply chain issues of our global competitors. Um, you know, all of these things are important and we want to be science-based. And I think part of that is understanding the nitrogen cycle um, so that we can make good decisions on farm that are science informed. Okay, talk me through the nitrogen cycle. Where are some of the biggest losses? Yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna start and we're gonna, in this example of the poster, um, we've got urea as the most common source of nitrogen fertilizer and when urea is put on the ground or in the soil um, it automatically reacts with water and um, that urea um, undergoes a urea hydrolysis and becomes ammonium carbonate and if we could say um, the nitrogen has a choice um, it can go and become ammonia gas or become ammonium. So those are kind of the two pathways and there's there's different loss in each of those. So if um, the nitrogen goes the way of the ammonia gas, then it is susceptible to volatilization. And that's that loss of the nitrogen in the air, particularly when it's broadcast on the soil surface. So definitely when we think about the four R's of nutrient management, broadcasting um, on the soil surface is a really bad one because that's a huge source for loss. So this can be mitigated um, by the use of putting that nitrogen deep in the soil. Uh, so three to four inch deep um, really helps to mitigate and prevent those volatilization losses. So that's our, our first opportunity to prevent. Um, if nitrogen is shallow banded, so less than two inches, particularly those growers, um, you know, where they have the nitrogen side below, uh, an inch below and an inch uh, beside the seed. If they're seeding at one inch depth, that nitrogen's only being put at two inch depths and that is still very susceptible to loss through this volatilization process. So something like a urease inhibitor, like an agrotain type product will prevent this if deep banding is not possible. Um, just so growers don't overdo it, which um, you know we want to make best use of our, our fertilizer. If you're able to deep band, then you don't need that urease inhibitor um, for preventing loss through this part of the pathway. Um, the other part is a little bit more complicated. Here, um, if nitrogen goes into the ammonium form, this is a plant available form and this is where we want to force the nitrogen to go and to force the plant to take up ammonium. So the plant can do that and that is great, but under natural conditions, um, what we're gonna see is the nitrification process is gonna proceed. So we've got um, it forming nitrite and then nitrate. And I'm just gonna switch to this side of the diagram. And um, the, the nitrogen can move into the nitrate form. So the plant can take it up here. The problem is this form of nitrogen is susceptible to loss through the atmosphere through denitrification which is that's that bad one where you know the greenhouse gas emissions and um, this is the big um, concern where we want to prevent that 
or if we have heavy rains or um, sandy type soils, then leaching can be another source of loss. So this nitrate is a very, while the plants can take it up, it's really a form of nitrogen that's susceptible to loss. So if we use um, a nitrification inhibitor, we can kind of prevent this part of that nitrogen cycle from happening. We prevent the loss to due to denitrification and leaching and can force the plant to take up the ammonium. So um, dual inhibitors would have both uh, a product in there to prevent volatilization and denitrification. So at the end of the day, I think there's a fit for deep banding and there's also the fit for nitrification inhibitors to keep the nitrogen in that ammonium form so we don't have that um, greenhouse gas loss or the loss due to leaching. And you know, at the end of the day, Farmers want to get the most out of that nitrogen that they are applying to their crop. They want to make sure that is in the harvested grain. That's in everyone's best interest for profitability and the environment. And we just now need to talk through some of the economics of um, these enhanced efficiency fertilizers, because if they don't translate into a yield increase, then um, it's tough for producers to shoulder that um, environmental benefit um, or, or the cost of that environmental benefit. Now, how does climate play in? You know, we're looking at the loss here. Is this, you know, just specific to certain types of climates or do you want to kind of talk me through that? Yeah, um, I think the best way to look at that is in that 4R kind of package. I, and I know that's maybe too vague, but um, climate is a big, big package. So getting the right rate on um, for the environment that you're growing. So we're here in St. Albert where, you know, tremendous black soils, yield potentials of CWS wheat are in that 90 to 100 range. So you're applying a lot of nitrogen, but that crop also has potential to take up a huge amount of nitrogen. If you're at Hanna, for example, and you're applying 100 pounds of nitrogen, not smart because that nitrogen isn't being taken up by the crop and the longer that nitrogen sits when it's not aligned with crop needs the the bigger chance there is for risk and not that growers in Hannah would be doing that but I think that's one way to look at the the climate aspect of that. Absolutely now when you're looking at these different types of losses which one is the most I mean it's obviously different in each climate yeah. and growing area but which one is the most common that producers might not actually realize they're losing it that way? You know I I had a field day yesterday and um, we have growers who are broadcasting. So people who are even using planters, for example, and they have to broadcast that nitrogen and they're, they might be broadcasting an ESN urea blend. The ESN is not going to be as susceptible to loss, but still all that urea component is susceptible to loss. So I think, um, you know, it really depends on the individual producer and their um, what their equipment needs are. If they are only able to um, shallow band that nitrogen, volatilization is a big loss uh, potential. If they are in an area with sandy soils and high rainfall, then leaching is certainly a big um, potential for loss. So it is, like everything agronomy, shades of grey and it depends. Mm -hmm.